Hello everybody and today we're ready to rock and roll and to tackle the mean value theorem and we're going to dive a little deeper in, hopefully walk away uh, with some deeper understanding and appreciation for this very, very valuable theorem. And as a warm-up activity, I want us to plot the point negative 6, comma 4. And let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And in your notebook, you can just kind of approximate, you know, a, you know, a set of axes and follow along here. I think it'll be a valuable warm-up activity. Now, as we plot those points, the first thing they want us to now do is to draw a nonlinear function. Now, a linear would actually work, but it's just not as exciting. So, we're going to go with a nonlinear function passing through these two points, and we're just we're going to follow these prerequisites that the function is continuous on the closed interval and it's also differentiable on the open interval all right and so be as creative as you want i really don't want your picture to look the same as mine unless you're just uh you know lack of the creativity here but uh you know i'm going to draw something maybe like this got a little up and down motion to it now um, the next thing i want us to do is to draw a straight line connecting our two endpoints we'll do that the best we can right here Okay, not bad. I was thinking it was going to be worse than that. Um, the calcul let's calculate the slope of this red line. And so, let's see, we got negative 4 minus 4 all over 5 minus negative 6. I've got negative 8 over 11. Okay, pretty interesting slope. Definitely going downhill. I'll buy that. Negative 8, 11. So, okay, now I think there's one more piece to this activity. They said here, are there any other points on our function where the tangent line has the exact same slope as the line that we drew in red that joined the original points and then to sketch the secant lines? Well, just kind of eyeballing it here, I think we've got a point right here approximately that would be parallel, aka have the same slope, and then this rascal up here. So I'm going to kind of sketch those two tangent lines and and you'll hopefully be able to visualize that they there should be two blue points there where the tangent line is parallel to that secant line. And that's really what we're getting at when we build this mean value theorem. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the, you know, the formula component of it that we forget to appreciate the visual component and, um, and to be able to see those parallel secant tangent lines. Now that we're warmed up, we're going to get into the technical mumbo jumbo. And right up here at the top is what uh, we're going to use for our what I like to call our AP justification. All right, and that's sometimes the most overwhelming part is, you know, how do I justify this answer on a free response question so that I, you know, literally cross all my T's and dot all my I's. Well, just think of it this way. Let's break this long-winded sentence down that's here in this rectangular box. The first thing we've got to talk about is the two prerequisites or the two hypotheses that are involved. The, the, the fact that F's continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval. A lot of times they'll only tell you that F's differentiable and then you can, of course, uh, safely assume that it is also continuous. And here's where it gets really interesting starting right here. It says now we're, there has to exist a value of c within the interval a to b such that boom here it is there's our magical formula i, I guess uh, for lack of a better word <clears throat> the f prime of c on the left side represents the slope of a tangent line and then uh, f of b minus f of a all over b minus a that represents the slope of our secant line and all we're saying is that those slopes have to be the same, a.k.a. the lines have to be parallel. And I love this picture down here. I think this picture right in here really says it well. And sometimes a picture is worth a, a million bucks, and this is no exception. So really be able to, you know, I think get a firm grasp of, of this picture here. It you know, basically holds the same properties as the one we drew on that last slide. And uh, just a couple of words of advice here. Make sure that we've always checked those two hypotheses or the, the prerequisites that we say, the, the continuity part and the differentiability part. And then um, and just be able to put it in words like this because sometimes the questions aren't going to come up, you know, be real upfront and say, hey, mean value theorem. Sometimes they're just going to use descriptive words like the average rate of change or the instantaneous rate of change, things like that. And when you do see words like that all in the same sentence, you need to start thinking, oh, they're referring to the mean value theorem. 
But here's an awesome example to, to dive into and a great time to hit that pause button and go work this problem out yourself. See how confident you are. See if you really know the theorem as well as you think you do. And work this problem out and find that value of C that's guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Then come on back and watch me solve it. Okay, right, first thing I did up here in the box is I made a little asterisk and I reminded myself that this mysterious value of C is floating somewhere between 0.5 and 2, not including the endpoint. So when we get done, if we had, for instance, a solution that said C equals 2, we'd have to reject it because according to the theorem, C has to be within the interval. And the first thing I wrote is I kind of set up that magical theorem. Uh, I said F prime of C equals F of 2 minus F of 0.5 all over 2 minus 0.5. Now it's time to start evaluating. Now, for instance, how about this left? side. How about the derivative? Uh, how much energy did you spend on the derivative? Hopefully, hopefully you made like a beaver and did some splitting. And what I said is f is really 1 plus 1 over x, which is x to the negative 1. Why did I do that? Well, now when I take the derivative, I can avoid the quotient rule. And uh, I don't think the quotient rule is too hard or took a ton of time, but uh, certainly always chances of careless mistakes when we go down that road compared to how easy it was when I did it this way. Make like a beaver split it up, very easy derivative. Now come on back, so let's plug that in for f prime of c, and uh, evaluate the derivative at c, and we get this. All right, what was f of 2? f of 2, I had 3 halves. f of 0.5 was just 3, and 2 minus 0.5 is, again, 3 halves. Clean this up, just a lot of arithmetic right now. Negative 3 halves divided by 3 halves. Maybe you're working with decimals. I chose fractions. That's really negative 1. Cross multiply, negative 1 equals negative c squared, which implies that 1 equals c squared, which implies c is really plus or minus negative 1. Now, here's the kicker. Where does c have to live? c has to live within that interval right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reject the negative 1. We're going to toss it in the garbage. And we're going to say that c equals positive 1. And that's the value that's guaranteed by the mean value theorem. So here's the other trick. And I didn't point this out originally, was uh, did this curve up here, did this function pass the two prerequisites? Well, at first I was a little nervous. It had a vertical asymptote at zero, but the good news was zero was not within this interval right here. So the function is continuous within that interval. It is differentiable. And uh, in one, if I drew a tangent line in one, it would be parallel to the secant line that connected 0.5 and 2 right here. All right, I apologize that this copy didn't come out any cleaner, and it did. Uh, we'll do the best we can nonetheless. And uh, so they want us to know how many times this function satisfies the mean value theorem from the interval negative 6 to 6. So here's a negative 6, here's positive 6. We're going to connect to those rascals. There's my secant line. So the red line represents f of 6 minus f of negative 6 divided by 6 minus negative 6. Okay, now I'm going to switch colors. I'm going to go to blue. And I'm literally going to start at negative 6 and trace the entire graph just to make sure I don't miss one because it's easy to do. There's so many solutions here. So as I'm tracing it, I think I've got my first one approximately right here. Just Basically, just before you hit that maximum point, maybe just a whisker higher than I put, there should be a tangent line that's parallel. All right, continue to trace it. And I think just beyond that minimum, just past that minimum is going to be another tangent line that's parallel. Keep tracing that graph just before you hit the max. There should be another one that's parallel. All right, keep tracing, keep tracing. And then just beyond that min at the bottom, there should be another tangent line. So I was able to find four tangent lines that were parallel to my secant line. Therefore, there were four different unique values of C that satisfied the guaranteed um, hypothesis of the mean value theorem. On this slide, I want to do a quick crash course on Rolle's theorem, and I don't want you to think that it's some convoluted, uh, totally distinct, separate theorem. It really is the mean value theorem. It just happens to be a specific case of it. And it basically says, hey, what if, what if f of a equaled f of b? What would happen to that mean value theorem we posed earlier? Well, what happens is when you do your subtraction on top, you end up getting a 0 divided by b minus a. And of course, 0 divided by anything turns out to be 0, and we'll set that equal to the f prime of c that was in front of the mean value theorem. So basically, that's what Rolls uh, proposes. He said, what would happen if those two y values were the same? What would that look like graphically? I think you could visualize that. If that's a and that's b, they basically need to have the same y-coordinate, 
And whether I connected those points with a linear or a nonlinear function, we're basically guaranteeing that there's at least one point within that interval such that the, there exists a horizontal tangent line. So that's basically what Rolle's theorem is saying, is he's guaranteeing the existence of a horizontal tangent line. And we've done a lot uh, over the past couple of weeks where we've seen how valuable um, horizontal tangent lines can be. So really, I don't think earlier in my career, I don't think I gave Rolle enough credit. His theorem is a very, very important theorem. But what we want to do here is kind of play devil's advocate on these three pictures here. Is we want to kind of um, you know challenge the hypothesis and see if we can create some exceptions here. Uh, for number nine, we want to show a function that is discontinuous at b. And you're thinking, what's the big deal about this one? Well, remember the pre one of the prerequisites that it has to be continuous not on the open interval but on the closed interval. So let's say uh, here are our axes. Maybe there's my A, there's my B. And here's what I'm thinking. Maybe that's F of A, maybe that's F of B. But if we're not continuous, look at what we might hit. Maybe we've got a hole up here, and then the function jumps down lower. So here's a counterexample where the function's differentiable on the entire open interval, but it's not continuous on the closed interval. And of course, you can see, even though F of A equals F of B, there is no existence of a horizontal tangent line. On our second example, we want to show that f is continuous but not differentiable at d, which is an interior point. So basically what I'm picturing is, you know, here's my a, here's my b, and maybe we have some kind of, uh, you know, cusp-like behavior. And uh, even though f of a equals f of b, there is no existence of a horizontal tangent line. And last but not least, we're just gonna we're just gonna throw this last one away. I didn't like it, so but I hope you can appreciate uh, the first two graphs we did and um, why the Rolle's theorem fell through on those. All right, we're gonna wrap up this uh, video with one big bear here at the end, and and I'm gonna go ahead. And I'm just gonna skip part A. That's the intermediate value theorem. It's a great problem to try here um, if you're not feeling real good about the intermediate value theorem. But uh, I'm gonna skip that as far as our, my explanation goes. I want you to really dive into B here. Great chance, hit that pause button, see what you can think, see if you can sort things out, and then we'll share our thoughts. One of the more common questions I get on a problem like this is, how do I even know to be using the mean value theorem on a problem like this where they never, you know, they never specifically mentioned it? And I said, well, you know, as soon as you start trying to prove the existence of something, okay, and that's the word I'll throw out here, you're proving the existence. It's a lot of times we refer to theorems like this as existence theorems. Um, you know, that's a good hint. Um, the other thing is you've got the, you know, a specific finite interval. That's another good hint. And ultimately, you're going to be using H to prove that H prime of C equals negative 5, okay? You're using H to prove the existence of an H prime value. That really says it all that we're going to be using the mean value theorem. So if, we have a, if we're ever going to prove that H prime of C equals negative 5 and C lives within the interval 1 to 3, I have to show that H of 3 minus H of 1 divided by 3 minus 1, I've got to prove that that equals negative 5. That's my goal. And if I can do that, then I've proven that h prime of c equals negative 5 according to my mean value theorem. So I've got a lot of number crunching. h is a composite function right here that we're going to try to sort through. And let's see. Um, h of 3. So I need to do f of g of 3 and then subtract 6. So as I'm following my table, g of 3 is 4. f of 4 4 is going to be negative 1, and if I subtract 6, I end up with negative 7. All right, on to the next one. Let's do f of g of 1. So g of 1 is a 2, f of 2 is 9, and 9 minus 6 is 3, so I need to subtract a 3. Of course, I'm dividing by 2. Oh my goodness, look at this. This is working out so nicely. All right, so here's, let's work on our justification, how we're going to write this up now. All right, here we go. So we could say something like, since h is continuous on the uh, closed interval 1 to 3, okay, and differentiable on the open interval 1 to 3, and how did we know that that was true? Well, we knew that both f and g individually were differentiable, therefore the composite of two differentiable functions is also differentiable. Then the mean value theorem guarantees a value of c within that interval, okay, 1's less than c, is less than 3. That interval is very important, such that Okay, uh, such that h prime of c equals negative 5 because, all right, h of 3 minus h of 1, 
all over 3 minus 1 equal negative 5. And that's exactly how I would write mine up. Now there are, are other alternatives that could potentially earn full credit, but I think this is the simplest, most concise way of covering all of our bases. So hopefully you enjoyed the mean value theorem today, and we will see you in class tomorrow.